but I'm always so impressed by the way the music, John and the rest of the music department pick the music that fits so well with the words and the scripture of the day. And today we're actually sharing one very powerful passage of scripture today from the Old Testament that speaks very clearly to God's majesty and power. We're talking about Job chapter 38 verses 1 to 7 and 34 to 41. All the story of Job leads up to this moment when God responds. Listen once again for God's word. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? And all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that the flood of waters may cover you? Can you stand forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who, put, who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey of the lion or satisfy the appetite of the lion, young lions? when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey? And its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, what a surprising and shocking answer. Here was Job suffering by all accounts, unfairly. And yet God responds in a different way entirely. Help us, dear Lord, to understand what you were saying in that moment and speak to us because we have certainly felt those Job-like moments in our own lives. Bless us now as we contemplate so that we may trust. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Most of you know the story very well. Here is Job, a man who had everything going for him. He had wealth, he had family, he had land, he had everything that the ancient world would consider to be prosperity. And so one day, and we're not quite sure how this works, the story goes, and it is a story, it's a, like a form of a parable. It's not a true historical account by any means. It's a story about how people related to a God in a world that was unfair. And so in this story, God and Satan are standing around together and they look down upon the wonders of Job and God just lifts up Job as this incredibly faithful person. But of course, Satan just looks at Job and then turns to God and says, well, of course he is. He has every benefit. But you take all those away, and we'll see what he does. And sure enough, you know the story. Job has his wealth taken away, he has his family taken away, and his health. Everything. Land. He was left in total and utter despair. And beyond that, that would be bad enough. But Job had friends. And these friends were trying to be so helpful with all the cliches and all the things that people say to each other when calamity happens. Well, what did you do that God got so mad at you? And so forth and so on. Just tearing Job down even further. If he didn't think it could get worse, the friends helped it happen. Sure enough, finally, in all this utter despair, The one thing Job would not do is admit guilt when there was no guilt to admit. Everybody tried him to get him to to cop a plea, 
to say that there was something going on that caused this within Job. They needed it to be fair. And if Job had committed some horrible sin that Job wasn't sharing, then everyone else could rest easier knowing God was fair. But Job wouldn't, wouldn't bite. He wouldn't allow God off the hook because he had done nothing wrong. And so to the very point that God spoke, Job was claiming his innocence and calling out for God in, to perform justice. And so right then you see the tornado, the whirlwind. And all of a sudden, out of that, the very voice of God speaks. But not what Job had expected. Frankly, not what you or I probably expected either. Here's what he has to say. It's because God changes the paradigm. Rather than defend God's self, rather than say that Job had done something wrong, God hollers out, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And he goes on, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. In other words, Job, why do you think you even have the right to talk to me that way? Now, God didn't crush Job. God didn't even seemingly get upset with Job over the hollering and the screaming and the dismay and the questioning. I think what would have got, made God the maddest is if Job would have cursed God and died like his friends wanted him to do. You can scream at God. You can be angry. You can even question in doubt. The one thing you cannot do is give up on God. That's what's made clear in this passage. The problem is, in our populist 20 and 21st century populist theology, we've made God so imminent that it's hard to imagine God as transcendent. Now, what I mean about imminent. Imminent is God close to us. And, we, and I, I know I'm going to get in trouble on the way out again today because I like making fun of In the Garden, my mother's favorite hymn. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Well, God is so close to us walking through the garden. And that's true. God is imminent. God is close to us. But when God is only close to us, God is always our friend right by our side, then how do you deal with suffering? Because if God is that close to us, why doesn't God fix it? When you're dealing with moments of tragedy and unfairness and injustice in this world, you have to see God both imminent but especially transcendent, powerfully far away more powerful. And then you get a perspective of how this powerful, omnipotent creator and sustainer of the entire universe also has time for you and me, who may have a plan that is so large that it is more focused on beyond just my needs. I've heard theologians talk about that God is not this anthropocentric. Anthropos means man in Greek, and of course, centric means centered. Our society has become so human-centered that we think everything, including the world and the universe, revolves around me. Why did, it, why did the Pope and the, and the church around the time of Galileo force him into repentance when he still knew he was right? Because the church could not anticipate anything but the rest of the universe revolving around the earth. We need to be the center of our own universe. But a transcendent God that we can expand and understand helps us understand that we are not the center of our own universe. And God's plan may support us, may care for us, but it's larger than just God meeting every one of my silly needs. So I want to walk with you again through what it means to have a transcendent God, a large God. Because in my life, when I've doubted the most, when I've questioned the deepest, I haven't focused on the God who's near to me. I've had to focus on a God who's powerful enough 
to transcend my little needs for a greater, larger plan to bring all things together in the future as God works through it in the present. I need to see a big God in bad, difficult moments. And so I want, to, I want you to ponder with me when God, when God screams out through that tornado, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? What does that mean? Here's what it means to me. Visualize for just a moment the oldest known and most distant galaxy is 13.2 billion light years from the earth. How do you even comprehend that? And we observe it as it existed 570 million years after the Big Bang. Space and time were created in the Big Bang, and they were imbued with a fixed amount of energy and matter. That's how the world began. And as a person of faith, I believe that's how God initiated evolution and the creation of humanity through that event. Great crowds of clouds of these primordial, primordial elements coalesced through gravity to form the stars. In 1964, a couple of scientists from Bell Laboratories, their names were Arno Penzias and Robert W. Wilson, sat down together as they were developing satellites for Bell Laboratories. And they kept being frustrated because they couldn't get rid of this noise, this resonant noise that seemed to come in all directions. And over a period of years, they brought in scientists, physicists from every major university around the world to figure out what was that noise. And they came to realize that that noise was the echo of the Big Bang which is still ringing billions of years later throughout the universe, still existing and making noise. God still rings in creation. By the 1970s, physicists began to think of alternative scenarios for the universe's evolution. Say you tinkered with the value of gravity or altered very slightly the strength of the electromagnetic force. How would that affect the path of the universe's evolution? They played all those scenarios, all those little games, and they realized something extraordinarily profound. <laughs> you change any of the evolutionary process and even minuscule amounts and you destroy life itself. For example, gravity is roughly 10 to the 39 times weaker than, the electromagnet weaker than electromagnetism. If gravity had been 10 to the 33rd time rather than 10 to the 39th times weaker than electromagnetism, the stars would be a billion times less massive and it would have burned out a million times faster. No life. The nuclear weak force is 10 to the 29th times the strength of gravity. Had that weak force been slightly weaker, all the hydrogen in the universe would have been turned to helium, making the opportunity to create water impossible. And without water, no life. A strong nuclear, a strong, nuclear strong force you change that by as little as 2%, would have prevented the formulation of protons, yielding a universe without any atoms. No life. Decreasing it by 5% would have, given a uni would have created a universe without stars. If the difference in mass between a proton and a neutron were not exactly as it is now, roughly twice the mass of an electron, then all the neurons would have become protons or vice versa, and there would be no life. Goodbye, life. There would be none. The list of things goes on and on, and I don't even understand what I told you, let alone what I would tell you if I kept going. <laughs> 
astronomer Fred Hoyle gives a wonderful application to the depth and mystery of the Big Bang and creation. And here's what he said, and I just want to quote it, it's just a short paragraph. The fine-tuning of seemingly heterogeneous values and ratios necessary to get from the Big Bang to life, as we know it, involves an intricate coordination over vast differences of scale, from the galactic level down to the subatomic one, and across multi-billion year tracks of time. Now Hoyle was the gentleman who used and created the name Big Bang for the beginning of creation. But even he has questioned the very legitimacy of his own metaphor of an initial explosion. An explosion, he goes on to say, an explosion in a junkyard does not lead to sundry bits of metal being assembled into a useful working machine. Now I thought about that. It would be like an explosion in a junk car dealer, a junk car plant lot. And they're exploding. And then when the dust settles, you find that all the exploding metal objects fell together into a perfectly built Maserati. Red, please. <laughs> now, Hoyle would say, you can re-explode that junkyard several billion times, but I don't care how many times you do it, you're never going to get the perfect red paint job, cranberry, please, that I really want on my Maserati. You can do it billions of times. And you can explode it without any kind of creative power to manipulate it, and you're never going to get that perfectly scratch and dent-free Maserati, no matter how many times you blow up the junkyard. Now, that doesn't mean that the junkyard didn't blow up, but in the midst of the explosion, according to Hoyle, you have some power some creative power that manipulated the parts, did a mint cranberry red paint job on my Maserati, and then when the dust settled, it lays there beautifully. Big Bang alone, there's no possible way. You might get a Ford Pinto and then you'll have a second explosion. <laughs> Gotta be my age to know what that meant. But you're not gonna get the Maserati. There still, even for the person that named the Big Bang, has to be more than just circumstance to make what we have. Every bit of the little differences that would have changed it, he does not believe could have happened by, by happenstance. It had to happen by some wisdom, powerful source guiding evolution to what we have today. It's too perfect, and nature doesn't quite make perfection. Only a divine, powerful, creative being who continually recreates can make that possible. Now, when we make God so transcendent, God so distant that we have a deistic God, then we come back to in the garden. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Now I can stand next to God in full awe. Because the same God who might have been 570 million light years away still heard Job. And more than that, knew him by name whipped up a whirlwind and spoke directly to his need. And if you and I aren't humbled when we pray and when we feel an answer in our hearts that the same God who could be in the furthest galaxy 13.2 billion light years away is the same God who you feel once in a while deeply when you pray and you get support. Now that's a God that is worth worshiping and why this place should be full every single week. How can we ignore for any reason 
what that brilliance is willing to do to know the hairs on our head and to listen to our voice and care about little me and little you. Do we not owe all honor and all glory to that most magnificent being? Does that not guide us in what we give back to other people? For if God, that all-powerful and all-majestic being, could care about us, how can we not care for one another? How does that affect our giving? How does it affect our compassion? How does it affect our trust? A lot of unfair things have happened to me. And as a pastor... I see infinitely more unfair things that happen to other people. And yes, there are moments where it drives me to doubt. And in the doubt moments, I don't go to the God who's standing beside me because if I do that too quickly, I get even madder and more doubt-filled. In those moments when you struggle and doubt, go to the most powerful, transforming furthest parts of the universe that continue to grow and see God on God's grandest scale. And then all you can do is place your trust in that aspect of God. And then you can deal with the unfairness and the injustice of this world knowing that that powerful being has a plan that's larger than just my centered life. And I will trust in it, even when I don't understand it. I have no clue what 10th to the 39 anything is. But I can trust in the God who is greater than that understanding. Hold firm in your faith. Trust and renew your commitment to that powerful, almighty one who still knows what breaks your heart and will heal it anew. Amen.